This is Lucas Ryder, executive producer and co-writer of episode 612, Bastion Moreau Conclusion. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Talk about a commitment to one's craft. Aaron is back, everybody. Welcome to the award-winning The Blacklist Exposed podcast. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, back from the heart of Texas. And if you wait long enough, maybe I'll ask the right questions. <laughs> Any question. <laughs> Any question. Just a little question. Just just a little nugget of a, of, a, of a question. Just a little you know, question mark right there at the end. Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss number 20, Bastion Moreau, conclusion, written by Lucas Rader and the Johns, and directed by Christine G. I assume that's um, Mick G's wife, daughter, friend, I don't know, <laughs> sister. Show notes on our intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. Good to have you back, sir. How was the uh, South by Southwest? I am tired and we're going to c2e2 this very weekend <laughs> and from when you're hearing this within 24 hours we're doing that and i i have not had much rust in the last couple of weeks so i thank rory by the way rory shout out you did a great job i i advocated for you to take my spot and i was gonna retire and uh troy said i still owe him a lot of money so i have to work it off although it would have been fun to have rory come back this episode because he said he was going to be executed and then we could have gotten him a stay of execution as well <laughs> da-da, da-da, da-da. Bink. But don't worry, Rory will be back before the season's over in one capacity or another. Uh, we'll, we'll work that out. Definitely. And we're going to see him at C2E2 uh, 20, yeah, 24 hours go. from now. There you go. So we are <sighs> a little bit so uh, rusty because we're recording this. We just watched the episode. We're recording this one like literally like as it ends. No, we didn't. We got to see this one early because we got some <laughs> <laughs> work to do this weekend for C2E2. So you're getting this episode right after it ends. Uh, but we will talk about everything that we heard in Bastion Monroe conclusion, covering off on Red's final words to see if any of you were correct. Uh, we'll talk about the episode in detail. And then, of course, if you really want to have some fun, we got a special interview with Coy Stewart. Yes, Vontae Jones. If anybody remembers why that's important, you'll have to watch the rest of the season. So mm. we'll have that instead of special agent intel, since we'll do all the special agent intel at C2E2 this weekend. Oh, that'll be fun. Well, with that, let's see how you all answered last week's profiling question. What will Red's final words be? Let me just say, it's all wrong. A good chunk of you just wanted to hear Red say, I love you back to Liz. Another chunk said nothing. He would be allowed to live and the phone would ring. Well, it's close. That one's pretty close. But he still said two things. So it wasn't nothing. That's true. That's true. The rest of you had some creativity going on. Let's take it from there. Yeah. Right. Diane said, see you next season. Kyle says, I am your mother. <sighs> Kyle of all people. <laughs> we Mon all know that when he was a child. <laughs> what man? Monica mm -hmm. said, this will be a gas. Sabine said, forgive me. <laughs> what? No, that's not going to happen. Uh, Emmanuel said, I'll be back. Heather said, Katerina, I'm coming. Anthony said, send me back to Boston Legal. Betsy said, Rosebud. Well played. That's a movie reference. I, I get. I understand that reference. I get it. Uh, Linda said, well, that cabbage didn't sit well. <laughs> that sounds like uh, something he would say. Daphne said, Dembe, turn the AC on because it is hot where I'm going. Uh, Suzanne said, you can't love me, Liz. I'm a criminal. Criminals are notorious liars. Heather said, it's about time. <laughs> Damn. I can see him saying that as well. Uh, Anita said, I knew it was you. And I'm okay with it. And Tatiana, last one, said banana. Oh, the banana reference. Yep, uh, banana. Good one. good one, good one. All right, for next week's profiling question, we want to know who will find the flash drive first? And does anybody else feel bad for that mom and kid? Because they're probably going to die. You know that, right? Yeah, definitely. Or the house will get burned down or blown up or something. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna end bad. <sighs> well, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, thanks, everybody, that answered the profiling question. Now... Let's make our own luck and dig into this week's case profile. I missed that sound. I still say it's a lightsaber, but Troy tells me otherwise. Red gets a stay of execution for 48 hours after Cooper chest bumps the president to force his hand in order to have Red track down Ava Ziegler's killer from last week, the one and only Bastion Monroe. The only one. Moreau. I keep saying Monroe. 
<laughs> it's Moreau. Best Moreau has the uh, nice MI6 agent still in custody, so he can get the dossier from him. Turns out there's information on the dossier that is not about reclaiming German nationalism as he thought, thanks to Red. And the one time Samar actually remembered something, the password to decrypt the dossier. Were you a little bit were you, were you a little bit upset about that because of the fact that she remembered it? I thought for sure she'd get the wrong password and then Red would give it to, <laughs> to Moreau and then it wouldn't work. And Moreau's like, what are you trying to pull over on me, Red? I'm actually kind of glad because that would have been, I like the way her, her storyline played out better this, because I think we were all thinking that, right? Oh no, don't tell the one person that can't remember anything. That's a bad idea. Uh, but then it didn't work out that way. So thankfully that I like the way it, it played out in the episode. It was unexpected. It was a, a nice, a nice twist. Yeah, it was a nice twist. And then uh, lastly, red turns Bastion into Anna, the only one that could have known red's whereabouts. But just before Moreau could take her out, Liz and company show up, letting Anna get away. The dossier flash drive appear to be lost, but not really. They're in the backpack, and Moreau is sniped by the president's head of Secret Service. Everybody apparently is bad currently in the uh, in the Blacklist current administration. Including Liz, because now we can officially say that Liz shows up at the wrong time in multiple occasions, so I think we can finally use Liz gonna Liz. I'm officially at Liz gonna Liz. Yep, I'm officially there. This episode kind of kind of took me <laughs> took me there. Gonna have some issues with that one, but we'll get there. I thought it was interesting. We got introduced to a new group known as the Black Fist. They're a group of German nationals that Moreau thought that he was going to be working with in order to uh, save his country. But what's more interesting was looking at the phone, I guess, reading the flash drive. Uh, I actually got a screen cap of this, and it was the Princip Initiative is what was on the phone and then he tapped on the Prince of Initiative and then it looked like there was an email after that. But the one thing I noticed about the Princip Initiative, I don't know if you guys know your history lessons, but Princip is actually the last name of Gavrilo Princip, the guy that actually shot Archduke Ferdinand and was the catalyst for the First World War. What? So I'm wondering if there's a tie here. Like this is like Something about a larger assassination huh. attempt or something that could start World War Three, or something of that nature. I just thought it was interesting that they used Princip. Uh, I thought that was uh, something we should probably look into a little bit more. Well, I'm glad you did because I didn't realize it was something I was supposed to look into. <laughs> so thanks for that. No problem. So keep that in the back of your mind, all you uh, internet detectives out there. Uh, see where that goes. Uh, something else to keep you all busy inside of the Princip Initiative folder was an, what looked like an email that was sent to the fire marshal with an identification and confirmation code. Like says, from Living in Living Color? Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that guy? The guy actually signed it with Bill at the end. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it said, uh, please find attached a list of agents involved in the termination deadline. Termination sounds very dire. Drop point will be set on March the 7th, 2019. Target will be moving west in vehicle with Hunter at approximately 1336. Further adjustments to plan. And there's some kind of confirmation code on there that I couldn't pick out all the characters on. But the uh, the uh, agents that will be involved are named Kyrie, Dark Mind, and Douglas. I don't know. This is like some X-Men stuff. First, we've got the Black Fist, which is kind of like Iron Fist. And then we have Dark Mind. And uh, I don't know. I, I feel like did uh, did Disney buy Sony as well as Fox because then maybe that's what else start to make some sense where you, I'm coming from. You'd be happy for that for the Spider Man to come back into the fold. If you get Spider Man and Blacklist, man, I am on board. I will justify that to the ends of the earth. I can figure that one out. Yep, makes sense to me. <laughs> Bye, Samar. Bring out Peter Parker. I can do it. So what did you think about the overall story? Before we get into the characters, uh, I haven't I haven't done this for a while, so I almost forgot how to blacklist. What um, what um what, what did you think about this? I mean, you guys talked about last week, which dodged a bullet with me because <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of last week's. So yeah, I was say we should start with you. What was your impression of the last two episodes, Aaron? And then that'll set up the stage for how you feel about this one. Uh, um, well, I love the show. And I have sp spent a good twelve episodes. Is that what this? Is that what this at? Twelve well, would right? be this one. Yes. All right. It's been a good twelve episodes with this diehard balls to the wall, hell on wheels attempt to get an answer as to anything about Raymond Reddington. 
and Liz has dumped her child off with, you know, grandma daycare. She has uh, cut ties with her sister because her sister was scared of her. She has risked her career. She turned this guy in. She was willing to go to the ends of the earth and then never asked the question when she has the opportunity and just says, love you. So didn't like that part of it. <laughs> How's that? Didn't like that part. I mean, last week was I, my biggest problem with last week was the insane, which you guys already talked about it. And I think I left the voicemail, the insane moment you went from conviction to execution. I mean, that's never happened in history. You can literally walk up there and say, please kill me. And they'll be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We got to wait three years. But, you know, it's TV. But even in TV time, I was like, what? <laughs> what? But mostly it's it's more about I feel, and I'm trying to be genuine because I am a fan. I love the show. We've talked about ad nauseum. I've, I've enjoyed most of the season. It's that character stuff. And we're going to talk, I think we'll talk more about the characters in a little bit. And I think I could probably hold some of that until then. But just to give you an overall vibe, Troy, that's where I landed was I enjoyed the episode. This one more so than the last one. But then we're glad you're uh, back this week. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did. Overall, like as an episode, it was fun. I mean, it was really good. I loved seeing Harold Cooper, like just, I mean, basically risk his life and career for Red. Uh, I thought that was, that was interesting. We all kind of knew it was going to happen. People on the internet was like, is Red going to die? What? I mean, they're renewed. Yeah, he's going to be fine. He's going to work out. It's not going to be like the ghost of Reddington haunting the Blacklist post office for the next couple of years. An entire season of flashbacks. It, but I, I have I I have to be honest. I have a genuine concern about that choice that it does the character of Liz a disservice the way it was written here, in my opinion. That's the nice way to say it. Yeah, and it, and it puts the fans at ease a little bit in the sense that Red's safe, but it also puts the fans in turmoil because you can only pull that like, oh, I'm not going to tell you yet because we got another season coming. You can only pull that chain so many times before the fans start to riot. Yeah, this was a this was one where it, it was I think too, it was too far because you you set everything up that you have a woman who is hell. We, we might as well just jump into Liz and then we'll 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 end cap it with Red because we're already here, right? Sure. So you have a character who has built the entire season on getting to getting this objective, has left her child, which we already know she loves her daughter more than anything. But she's putting her child off so she can deal with this problem. She sets him up. She gets him in jail or gets him put in jail. You know, and I, and I understand what they were building to that this notion that the love he feels, it doesn't matter why it's there. It's, it's important to her. I understand the notion that they were going for. I just don't feel like it was earned because you created this character who was hell bent the entire season and then she just gives it up and it doesn't work for me. And that that arc for her character doesn't work for me personally. How did you feel about that? Is it okay with you? I mean, you know, we're longtime fans, so this is coming from love. Well, we we kind of touched on it two weeks ago where I was like at the end of season five, she's like, I'm going to find him and I'm going to kill him. And it's like, okay, so that's where Liz's headspace is for season six. And then she gets into season six and Red starts saving lives. And she's like, well, you know, maybe he's not such a bad guy after all. So I can see the progression and I can see what they were trying to maneuver towards and how they were able to play it off. And I did like the way it played off because at the end of the day, these guys have been working together for a long time. So mm -hmm. if you even if you don't like somebody at your office, let's say uh, at your day job, you could still understand that you've been together a long time so you can appreciate what they bring to the table. So I can I can appreciate the writing from that perspective. But when you ended season five on I'm going to fight him and I'm going to kill him, like you got to at least say, hey, man, I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're out. But dude, what was all this for? You know, you got to at least ask that kind of a question. Like why? When? What What was the timing all about? And I think that maybe the, they're not asking the timing question because we all kind of know that it was because Tom flipped sides. Mm -hmm. But there's got to be like a you know, why did you? If you're saying I'm going to be rich, why did you bank all this money? Like, like what is the purpose of all the cash you're going to leave me if you were going to die? Like, just a question like yeah. that, like, or or even a question of how much money am I getting would be a question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's where I, she just had to she had to ask something, and and she didn't ask anything. She just was like, eh, whatever, you know. And if that's really to drive story for wrestler, because at the end of the episode, she's like, I hope you can let it go too. Sure doesn't look like wrestler's going to let it go. Yeah, I thought it did. 
I mean, he he seemed okay with it. I didn't. Did you get the vi- a different vibe Come that on. he was? It's like TV trope one hundred and one. Like so, so really, Liz, you're you're good with this. Yeah, I'm totally good with it. I hope you are too. Slow camera pan across wrestler's face, cut to black. <laughs> hey man, I hope you're right because to to let it die would be insane. And I'm sure he's going to go after and try to find out, you know, who set him up and everything else. And we have this new conspiracy, so we're going to be working on that. I, I just feel like the the arrival was the journey was not justified with the arrival. The the payoff was not worthy of the journey. It feels to me like we spent twelve. Typically, when we have this like mid season, and this is kind of like the mid season finale of a typical year. Sure. Usually that's when, like a big change and man, you get like all amped up and there's a big cliffhanger and things turn and I'm like, ah, oh, that's great. This is not, I got to say, this is probably the one season where I don't feel that way at this point. I feel instead, and I'm not trying to be like a, a Debbie Downer. I know you guys love the show and I, I enjoy the show and it's not like I'm going to quit watching it or anything, but I'm just, I'm like being honest about it. It feels like I just spent 12 episodes and I went nowhere. I'm right back at where I started and at, I try to put myself in the character's shoes, even even giving an allowance of it's it's TV, man. They got to stretch it out. They can't give away everything. I get it. I get all that. Then don't make that the crux of your of of the season. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Give me something. Give Dembe telling her that as soon as Red dies, he promises he will he will tell her the truth. Give her that little tidbit. So then she. We get why she would want to at least tell him how she felt before he died. You know, just do something like that. But to just have her basically give up because the power of love, you know, she Huey Lewis her moment. I, I don't. <laughs> that's a, that's a little throwback for the kids. I just don't. I don't. I didn't buy it. Sorry. I just felt like twelve episodes where I went, I went in a big giant circle. That's actually my daughter's ringtone on my phone for myself because she likes Back to the Future so much. The power of love. Yeah. Get out. Totally. That's pretty awesome. Good for her. We want to get back in the positive. I, I didn't mean to bring anything down. I really didn't. I'm just being honest. I don't think that we went through 12 episodes and got nothing, right? We got the big reveal that Alan Fitch and Katarina are working together. I think that was a real nice bonus. I think that you got um, some new players on the board, right? We got, you know, we uh, Anna was introduced in episode two, and we're like, why is there this random redhead that's like barking out orders to some assassin? And then you find out she's part of this bigger conspiracy. So I really think Anne is a really nice addition to the show. Um, I loved her character. I think she's great. Yeah. Like she's, she's my kind of bad guy. I and like she, her a lot. And she was in Falling Skies, which is a show I absolutely adored. She was uh, uh, Rebecca Mason. Um, oh, you were the one that watched that. Uh, there were many of us. And it was good. for <laughs> They were two, all in your for, living room. For two seasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah... I, you know, we got Diaz back in the picture. We got the whole cabal map. Are these the, is this new cabal or is this the enemies of the cabal and all that playing? So the thing is, it's like you did 12 episodes to get to this point. It goes back to that whole conversation of, you know, does network TV need to be 22 episodes long anymore? And I think this is probably one of those things where that may have suffered a little bit because you had 12 episodes to like really set up what the season was about, which is going to be this new conspiracy. And I'm excited for the new conspiracy. Like, don't get me wrong. Like the back 12, like I'm super excited to see where this goes. And there was lots of good. I mean, I really dug how a lot of things played up, paid off. You know, the bugs came back. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff that was leading up to this came back. But I love the one flew over the cuckoo's nest episode. I thought that was a fantastic episode. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it, yeah, it's like if you look at it from the standalone perspective, each episode was good in its own right. But when you look at it from the Liz journey I think it almost did a disservice to the Liz character in these last 12 episodes in a way. Absolutely. And you know how the internet is with, with Liz. You know, they, they're very temperamental about the character of Liz, and this is going to feed right into that. I, I but, firmly believe that. But the internet does love when Liz and Red are on the same side. Mm-hmm. So if anything, this will unite the internet into the next 12 episodes because they are on the same page currently. Well, then this should never come up again. She should never be bringing this up I, I i don't know how do you handle this at this point when she basically she she thought he was going to die and she didn't take her opportunity there when she's had every opportunity to ask the question or force the answer she has backed away from it so at this point do you just never have her ask the question that's what i would I, do I, just, I, I think that actually would be more interesting to be quite honest at this point because now she's like i really don't care who he is i know he loves me and blah 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 i think now would be cool like if you could figure out how to 
unravel the story in a way that it comes like naturally like she finds the like when she finds the bag of bones and then or kind of like when tom specifically when tom found the bag of bones and reads the dna report and literally like has that like a gasp moment you know i i think that would be really interesting to see liz come to that realization as something big on like knocks her on her ass basically and goes holy crap that's what it's about i think that would actually pay off a little bit better than her just getting exposition from red and, and you could tell in the episode that there were so many lines that were painting the picture that we're not going to tell you anything. We're not going to tell you anything. There's that one where I, I never like to know how magic trick works, spoils everything. That's like total foreshadowing for, for Liz bailing on that question. So, I mean, they were, they were painting the, the picture. The canvas was being, you know, the brush was on the canvas. I get it. But, but then but. they were talking about the tigers and the climax thing. And I'm like, where's the climax? <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's been, it's really been set up that Liz becomes more grateful to have somebody who loves her so enormously than know the actual truth. So the question becomes for us, the audience, is that good enough for you? And I, I don't really don't know where, because we're putting this out before people have actually commented on the episode. So I'm, I'm really curious what feedback is going to be. Because overall, I mean, I really, I did like the episode. I enjoyed the episode. It was just that character, that character arc over the season and how it culminated into this episode. Cause this is where it really, she, she kind of put it out there. Hey, I'm good. I'm walking it off. It'd be interesting to see what the fans thought of that. Maybe we're, maybe I'm in the minority. I don't know. I don't know. I, I know a lot of the fans were the majority and you were in the minority last week. What because about they, the time frame thing? Well, not the time frame thing, but everybody was like, they loved last week's episode because of the red and Liz loving each other and conversations and doing all that fun stuff. And, you know, so I think that's the, the joy of the episode that happened was if you could put all the TV trope stuff aside between the cliffhanger. No, and I the, did like the moments. The I moments will were really I, good. Yeah. I did like the moments. The, I love you thing was very, uh, that was very, very sweet. It's, it's even if it was the wrong thing to say, <laughs> my, my more like, I at least kind of understood not, not really understood, but kind of understood where Liz's character was coming from in the last episode because you know Dembe is going to tell her everything once he does die. I, I just wish it would have been said or pointed out. But after he's you know given his immunity deal again and then she's just going to drop it because she's happy with it, that's probably where I had the more. So this episode was where I had the bigger problem. Last episode, I didn't really have as much. I get, I get that moment. Got this, it. I think, is going to re- be reacted to a little differently. Let's get into the other characters. Let's get back on the back on the plus. Sure, sure. All right. So we got music in this episode. And there was actually only one song. Uh, the song was right at the end as Red makes comments about the smells in the post office. Uh, Aram thinks it was him, of course. But we hear Scott Walker's The Old Man's Back Again. And I uh, feel that was a very fitting choice for this episode. I loved it. As always, you can hear the songs and more over on the Spotify and Apple Music playlists. We have links for those over at theblacklistexposed.com. Now we move into the other characters and we'll, we'll end on Red. We already talked about Liz. Anna, she puts herself in charge of the task force at, at the end of this. And we are introduced to this character. We get a, a good understanding of where she, who she is now in this episode. And she does ask a few questions about the First Lady. So, and since she's our new bad, I, I kind of want to know what did, what did you think about that? Like, what was she alluding to with the with the first lady? That's the one thing that was really scratching my head at the end of this episode. I'm like, are they having an affair? Is the first lady somebody that is going to be a big reveal, and you're going to be surprised who the first lady actually is? Uh, does Diaz want to off his wife? <laughs> I mean, because he seems pretty shady. He probably wouldn't uh, do that so, or he would do that. So because uh, he said it was another problem for another day. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm 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 curious. The first lady has my interest peaked. We'll put it that way. There, there, that wasn't a throwaway line. There was something there. Oh, there's definitely something there. It's going to that's some 24 type foreshadowing, especially especially when she was like, uh, how's the first lady? And then she's like, give my regards to the first lady. <laughs> it was like. Like one, one moment it seemed like you wanted to like offer. And then the next moment you were like, I hope she's okay. Have a good night. Yeah. And I I got a feeling the, the president is basically going to be the big bad overall the back half of the season. Isn't that kind of the, the understanding you got? Or somebody's really pulling his strings. Cause remember Kirk was the one that funded his campaign. Right. It was pretty cool to see him back though. Right. Wasn't it? Yeah. I was kind of thinking we hadn't, you know, Kirk escaped 
from his uh, Adrian Shaw conclusion episode, and we haven't mm-hmm. seen him since. But since he did fund Diaz's campaign, maybe he's still involved somehow, and we might see him again. That would be cool. I really liked Kirk. Uh, one thing that I, I have to say, and I, I think I said it earlier, but Anna, already one of my favorite bad guys in the blacklist. And I know that sounds weird because she hasn't done much, but it's just her and how she takes charge. She knows Harold knows something about her and she doesn't care. She's still like, nah, it's still my task force. Here's the rules. Here's what we're going to do. I don't want to do this anyway with the president. You suck at him. So here, you know, it's just like she has a great attitude that I love. And I also love the fact that she was always on the president's right hand side. Because it's right-hand a right, man. Right, right-hand man, but <laughs> she's not a man. She's a woman. Yeah, well, speaking of, Red has no respect for Time's Up because he compares her to an STD pretty quick. <laughs> and like, and would throw gasoline on her in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, we find out that she hires Moreau to kill Reddington. Just, just tell him to leave town. I don't understand that plan. That was a bad plan. And uh, it, it goes south. It goes south. And also, it gets a poor mail carrier killed thing and, and here's the right and is not the best blacklister or the best baddie on the episode for me because you put a tracker on them you tell the audience hey only cooper and i will know where this tracker is and then you go send moreau over to find red yep it's like how dumb could you be now red literally knows that you are behind this whole thing yeah that was <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't even gonna bring it up but since you did <laughs> yeah. And also, if I was in charge of the task force, I would make him wear that all the time. Yes. Everywhere he went. Don't well, they, care. Well, they have, they the, have very tiny tag or something. I mean, just basically GPS tracking. We're going to track your phone. Something along those lines. Well, he had the, he had the tag in him from the from the pilot. Not the cheap one, the better one that he requested after his, part of his deal was written in the back in season right. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you got good memory, man. It's like you write this stuff down. Or watch a lot. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we'll find out more about Anna. I think that's gonna that's gonna really be interesting where she goes. She's got a lot of fun stuff coming up. I would bet Diaz. I, I don't know. I mean, the president's a little shady. Uh, he and Anna use Moreau to wipe out those who knew about a plot against their own country. So, what do you think the plot is? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Uh, well, I think with looking at the Princip thing, like I said, I think it's still another larger assassination or or a multi level assassination. But wouldn't it be cool if you could figure out a way? And this is me going back to my like alias love, but say there was some kind of organization out there could literally figure out a way to assassinate all the heads of state at the same time, like a coordinated global attack. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. I'm so, all on board. And then and then and then each country is pointing at each other because they don't know who did it, and that starts World War Three. So, hmm. And if Red is uh, Katarina's brother. Then it comes with to a war possibility between the United States and Russia, and maybe he'll choose wrong. <laughs> well, then, <laughs> or cho- then or choose the opposite then, of what we think. Then he'll be in a situation where it won't be anybody's country because it'll be wiped out. Yep. Ba boom. Ba boom. All right. Well, let's move on to let's see. Dembe. <laughs> Dembe. Can Sham come over and play heads up at our house? Dude, please? that was so funny. The whole the whole the nightmare sequence, and he's like, ha ha ha. It was so animated. I don't think I've seen that much energy because the character is very, you know, stoic and man, a few words and, you know, man of action, that sort of thing. It was so great to see him get to just be goofy. Yeah, it was so Hasham. It wasn't so Dembe. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, I mean, it was almost like a Rams character for a minute. I mean, it just, it's just so surprising to see him do that. And it was so funny. Like, honestly, it was one of my favorite moments of the episode. I couldn't stop laughing. I watched this three times. And especially how terrified they look. They look so terrified <laughs> when, when the poor guy's wife is like, oh my gosh. Uh, no, I watched this three times and every time I watched it, I, I got duped. <laughs> by the this, commercial, right? Yeah, it felt like it was a commercial. I was like, yes. And I'm like, wait a minute. We got, we got a, we got a preview episode that doesn't have commercials in it. Why do I think it's a commercial? <laughs> I, I, every, every time I've watched it, I've watched, well, I've watched it twice. But both times it got me too. And I'm like, and I honestly had to rewind it. I'm like, why is Dembe in a commercial? That's just weird. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's so funny. He's so funny. But yeah, it totally yeah. it totally felt like it was a commercial. Very good. And honestly, I wanted to to buy the app. So oh, we play is it a real game. We play heads up all the time. And uh, if you're waiting for C2E2 for your autographs and stuff, that would be a, a great get you download. And you can do some uh Star Wars <laughs> trivia or Marvel trivia or whatever you want to do while you're at the C2E2 event. With well, you waiting in line, play heads up. Yep. All right. Well, Aram, he gets to care for his fiance, but also 
he cares for the task force and her condition is deteriorating. He thinks it's time to tell Cooper. And also I want to point out he's a slob who leaves his bike in the living room. It's just, I mean, there's dirt and bugs and whatever else on the tires. That's just gross, dude. Yeah, but sometimes you can't have it on the wall or anything because you need the wall space for other stuff. Like I'm shelves and gross. pots and Don't put it in the living room. And- Don't do it in the living room. What What do you think about um, him telling her it's time to tell Cooper? I think that's a standard around response, to be quite honest. I think he always puts job first, uh, even though he has the caring gene. I mean, I, I know Samar always puts the job first, but I think he's always the one that's looking out for the greater good. So he's almost taking on the... The, the nomenclature from, from wrestler because we know wrestler has been a little more shady. So he's kind of taken over that good boy scout uh, moniker, if you will. And so I, I think the character moment of it all, I think is fine. I think that's exactly where he should be from a character moment at this point in time. Um, but at the same time, I think he has to understand he has to be the fiance and she has to be the one to tell Cooper. He can't go do it for her. And I think that comes across in this episode. So good, good on yeah. around. Yeah, it's none of his damn business. That's I love that I he's say. nervous, though. He's like, he's like, where is she? Where is she? Where'd she go? I can't find her. <laughs> Little puppy dog. Well, that leads us to Samar, who's compromised in the field, broods about it on a rooftop, and eventually tenders her resignation. And apparently she added lung cancer to her pot- potential illnesses. I don't Yeah, I felt like other that. than Red, this is the first time I've seen, like, like, well, Tom. Tom had the cigarette when he was doing the whole Nazi shave your head thing. And yeah, the, he's a bad smoker. She's a good smoker. But yeah, but she, this is like the first time we've seen like someone smoking on the show from the from the cast. It was weird. I, I felt well, a little you, taken out of the se- sequence a little bit. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm an ex-smoker. I quit Whoop. Um, long time ago. But usually when you watch people who smoke on TV, it looks like they don't smoke. And you can tell because anybody who smokes, you know what I'm talking about or has smoked. You get it. You're like, eh, you're trying to look cool. You're trying to look like you're smoking. Tom was one of those guys. But. She, I don't know, maybe she smokes in real life because she's got it down. Like, she's got it down. And she does the whole inhale, exhale, right? It's not the movie and TV inhale, exhale, where they don't actually inhale anything. <laughs> you know, it actually looks like she's smoking. I know these are little things, but but to a next smoker, we pay attention to stupid stuff like that. Like, ah, yeah, you failed on that acting class, but she did a great job. I go. am <laughs> I'm thoroughly impressed with her level of smoke skill. But at the same time, who cares? If she's going to die anyway. Why not start up now? Well, I mean, you know, and honestly, she'll probably forget that she's a smoker by tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Ron wakes her up. Hey, are you still smoking? I don't smoke. I quit five years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Weird. Oh my god. What did you think about her tender and her resignation? That felt like a little extreme. Yeah. No, I don't think it was extreme. I think she realized that she was compromised in the field and she she literally was a liability. She felt clearly, you know, broken up about losing the MI6 guy and put it all on her shoulders when it really wasn't, you know, on her because Moreau would have shot him anyway as he tried to escape, even if she tried to take a shot. Right. So but I, I think I think it's an interesting dilemma now because what does she do? Um, does she go back to Mossad? Does she just sit at home and crochet until <laughs> Ram comes home with the bike and she's like, get that damn bike out of the living room. Oh, and, um, and then she I'm yells it a gonna, second time because she forgot to you know, tell him that she said it already I'm the first time. Leap right over the crochet thing. I, I, I really feel like she's going to find some, either a solution to her illness and what is going on with her brain, or she is going to, uh, She'll find a way to, to to work through it or to recover because I, I can't see she's leaving the show. So That would be a cool blacklister, like someone that has some magical cure brain juice or whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they, you know, Red's got the guy that locks memories up. Maybe they can unlock her problems. Maybe, but I don't know if that's the same kind of issue. That's definitely not the same kind of issue, but this is t- we went through the judicial <laughs> process in a matter of 15 minutes. I'm pretty sure we can figure something out here. <laughs> Shoot shark piss up your nose and you're all good again. Yeah, this is uh yeah, I, I think we're going to be all right. <laughs> all right, let's move on to Cooper, man. I tell you what, I've been waiting for a good Cooper moment for the last few episodes. It's been a lot of Cooper just barking out orders and that's about it. This was, this was fun. Harold Cooper had a lot of fun. He goes toe to toe with the president. He's got that great sarcastic bit at the end with Anna. You know, the the job carries an extraordinarily high mortality rate, 
which means she going to die. <laughs> and he's looking point. forward to it. <laughs> oh, I love that dig. And I the, thought that was just so great. The difference between the deliveries, too. You look at when Red dug on her about the whole crabs thing, and he mm-hmm. was just so like pissed off about it. Harold kept such a straight face the entire time. <laughs> As he was delivered, like, you're being sarcastic. He's like, no, I truly am not. <laughs> it was so good. Harry played it so well. I loved it because at that moment, she 100% knows that he knows something about her or he doesn't trust her. And it's a bold statement. And she just looks at him like, did you just say that? And he's just smiling. Yeah, I did. <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> so here's the big thing. So we have Red, who's like, Cooper, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Thanks for saving my life. You know, even if it didn't go through, I would have absolved you because you're good at your job. And he's like just totally pimping Harold the whole time. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, he's an imposter. This is not the Raymond Reddington that Harold worked with all those years ago. Now that we know that. So how does Harold respond when he finds out that this is not Raymond Reddington? That's a great question. You know who should have asked that question? Liz. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Too soon. (laughs) Oh, Ah, uh, oh man. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one. That is a that is a really good question. I'd love to see how that gets explored. Because I, I would love to see how it gets explained. <laughs> I mean, wrestler, he can't he can't hold on to this by himself. I don't think at this point he's got to tell somebody. Mm, I mean, we're, we'll we'll talk about wrestler here in a second. Anything else on Cooper before we move on? I mean, were you surprised that he went toe to toe with the president over this? I don't think I was surprised by it. I think I was more shocked at the, uh, he's got German friends. Like, like it's not like I'm going to go tell the papers. He's like, no, I'm going to go tell the Germans directly. And then we're going to be at war. Like how, who pulls that card out of their back pocket? Usually it's like, it yeah, was a I'm bold go card for a, uh, for a mass murderer that yeah. you're protecting. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I'm going to go tell TMZ or the rap or somebody, but no, he's going to go call the Germans. Yeah, that was a bold step. That's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it plays out for him. All right, wrestler. He tells Liz last week to let it go that he's just a man that loves her very much. But the closing scene makes me think wrestler is is not going to leave it alone, or at least it makes Troy think that. My, I'm I'm a little unconvinced, but I understand if that if that makes sense. And he does ask her, didn't get the chance to ask the question, or decided not to. And she does basically, you know, as we already talked about. So you have a theory about wrestler that he's going to pursue this. Is that where you're at with that? I mean, that's what you if, were. If was I'm being from true to characters, episode? I spent five years, five years chasing this man on a task force. And then I spent another five and a half years working with the man that I was trying to put behind bars. You're damn right. I want an answer. <laughs> Like if wrestler, if wrestler steps aside and says, Hey, I love you too, buddy. I, I think that's when I would riot because wrestler <laughs> re- wrestler needs wrestler needs closure. He lost his fiance over this thing. He's um, jeopardized his career. He sat in the big chair. He slept with everybody in the post office. Practically. I mean, this guy, this guy deserves to know the truth. And I think he's going to go after one it. person <laughs> and she doesn't remember it. <laughs> I'm just going to keep hammering that joke home. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, hmm. The only thing that makes me doubt that is last week, he's telling her to let it go. So I don't, that wouldn't make much sense. What he to wants her- to make the collar. He's like, don't worry about it. Don't worry. It's mm. all good. And then he's going to come in and swoop in and find the answer. And they'll be like, look, I got your answer, Liz. Can we go out now? Well, I, I've speculated that, you know, once he knew the truth, that means he's going to, or once he knew that red's not red, he's going to die. That puts him on the death watch. That they signed his contract for seven. Yeah, but Why that could that could it? also that could be a promotion. You don't oh, know. Sure, yeah. you never they know. Mean, they bring yeah, him back, yeah. and he dies in the first episode. He could have one episode where you know it's just uh he get, gets killed in the cliffhanger, and he just comes back to say goodbye to everybody or something. Maybe nobody's ever really safe, no matter what contracts say. Trust me, they can always get rid of. Go watch Walking Dead; they can get rid of people. Okay. I mean, don't go watch Walking Dead because it's been on forever. But because they get rid of people go. without even telling them that they're gone. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes it happens. I'd be interested to see what happens. You know what? I, what I have really, really loved is the last few episodes. Wrestler, especially the last like probably five or six, wrestler's gotten a lot to do. Yes. Thank God. Thank the Lord. We've gotten a lot more, and I, I love watching the Boy Scout work. So I, I hope you're right. I really am. I hope 
he pursues it some more and he picks up the baton that Liz threw into the ground. What if what if he's pursuing it and as he's pursuing it, Red still tries to uncover who the hell turned him in in the first place and somehow wrestler gets caught in the crosshair of that. Oh, and he thinks wrestler's the guy. And that's and so he says to sights on wrestler because of it. And then Liz either has to come clean or it's too late. Because he did have that, you know, exchange in the courtroom where uh-huh. Red's like, like, why are you answering it like that? Do you know? Oh, yeah, something? Red knows. Red knows. Yeah. He knows. Yeah. So, no doubt. And that's going to come back. That isn't just going to go away. Nothing ever does on the blacklist, including the Mongolian throat singers. <laughs> <laughs> that creeps you out still or what? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe they actually used it when, when Ziegler died in the, on the floor. I liked it. I was glad that the bugs came back. I thought that was a really, I'm like, oh, that's the other person. We were wondering, you know, who is that other person? So that's pretty cool. There you go. So all that paid out. That, that's some some planning, some planning. All right. Now we're finally on a red. He equates Anna to having crabs and wants to burn her. <laughs> so you got that going on. Bluffs his way out of death, takes a chance on Monroe, knows Anna is involved, but needs proof to take her down. But he officially has his immunity agreement back. But I do want to, I just want to walk back a little bit. Yeah. I just want to walk back though and go back to the bluffing. That was my favorite part of the episode. The fact that he hinged everything on that. He can, he can solve this and nobody else can. And he didn't know Jack. I thought that was a a great Red Reddington bluff. 48 hours is adequate. (laughs) He's like, I don't know anything, but I'm getting a drink. We're going to celebrate. Let's have another one. So good. Ah, uh, so so funny. I, re- I really dug that. Okay, so the caveats. What were the caveats? Remind the audience. Um, for like words and stuff, or no? I just, I mean, roughly, like what are the, what are the caveats for him? He can't commit a crime. Oh yeah, yeah. He can't. Uh, um, he can't commit a crime. Uh, Cooper can't know he committed a crime, and like the task force uh, be persecuted. C- can't normally prosecuted. Yeah, can't uh, know he did a crime and and not turn him in. I believe is what they were. I think that was the deal. So it was the original. It's the same agreement. It really hasn't changed that much. Because yeah, Anna said that uh, she said it's the same agreement as before, but with a few additions. Mm-hmm. I think those were the additions. Like he can't he can't commit a crime, and they can't knowingly know he committed a crime. Well, he can't commit a crime was part of the original one because that was what the whole crux of the trial depended on. I Remember? Sp- I suppose. Even though no, he I committed mean, a crime, they had every a whole week. episode on it. <laughs> so I think I think it, it yeah it holds. Uh, here's, well, here's what he says. Okay. His two final sentences that nobody got right. I'll save my words for the next life. And then the phone rings. Please tell me somebody's going to get answer that. Yeah. There's nothing in there about, Hey Liz, by the way, I'm dying. This is my last thing. And uh, I'm going to let you know I'm your uncle or (laughs) Bob's your uncle or Dembe, your sister, Liz Dembe, your brother (laughs) would have been good too. So were you surprised by Red's final words? Well, yeah, totally surprised because it's not exactly what I expected to hear. But at the same time, I think I'll save my words for the next life is a very Raymond Reddington answer. Sorry, it's a Fred Reddington answer. (laughs) Fake Red. Fake Red. Yeah, I would. uh, mm, After last week, I wasn't I'm not surprised because last week when she says I love you and he doesn't say anything back. I'm like, okay. well, I think he couldn't say anything in that moment because he was just shocked. He was, yeah, he was. On the same token, this is a guy who never stops talking. I'm kind of surprised he didn't say anything, but I thought, I did think at this point he would tell her how he felt about her as well, but, uh, you know. I, I think actions, in this case, actions show more than words, and he's shown plenty of action over the course of six seasons. Hey, I wasn't, I didn't check the uh, the internet last week. Was there Were there a lot of the Reddington's back, or the, um, the Lizington's back? Um, because of that, I love you thing. There was a couple. You know, the Lizingtons are, are are cheering, and then you got Daddy Gate people were cheering, and so hmm. I don't think anybody has really left the theory camps. I think the theory camps are still very much entrenched. We've had this conversation. Once people get stuck on a theory, they don't want to change it. Troy, child. <laughs> Even man. when uh, I go to was it Ansel Garrick where he says, "When I was a boy, I want to sleep like I did when I was a boy." So go ahead, explain that one away. He's, I'm sure you have a cop out. He's but. in character. He has to say he's a man because he's playing a man. And I was a child is basically the writers toying with all of you. 
<laughs> I believe I believe that theory because they're like, ah, we clearly said it before, but now we're just going to screw with them. We're, t- <laughs> we're tired of hearing about it, so we're just going to feed you. I think it's funny. You, your little shop of horrors right now and your Seymour. All right, so Red honestly didn't uh, didn't know how to get to Moreau, but he does have 48 hours to find him, and then he gets that immunity agreement reinstated. It was, worked out pretty well for him, I will say. Thanks to Anna. You know what I was disappointed by in this episode? That he didn't have some long soliloquy or story about an owl. Because he what? heard he was standing outside, it was a nice night, and then the little you hear the little owl go, whoo, and he like turns and looks at the owl and kind of laughs. I was waiting for some like the owl is so wise. You know, the the things that he can learn when he is trapped for three months is amazing, or something like that. <laughs> You're so, such a dork. Uh, he does say that was a long three months. Yeah. That's how long it takes normally for one trial, let alone like 16 trials and an execution and a conviction. And I miss the judge, by the way. I really miss the judge. I really dug her a lot. Like, I loved her character. Who knows? Maybe we'll see her again. I hope so. Yeah. Well, you're going to run. We're going to get arrested again. <laughs> we're going to go back through this. Well, remember, Vontae Jones is out of prison now, too. So maybe there's like a, a parole hearing and you'll get your judge back. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That was nice that he did work out a deal for that kid. Yeah. And he breaks out of prison, quote unquote, breaks out of prison. Being That's the tr- end. Being transferred for being injured in jail. So now we've gone, we've gone 12 episodes. Uh, well, Red and gang know that Anna is a conspirator. They assume that they have an idea that the president is probably in on it. They're not sure, though. So the last half of the season is probably going to be centered around that. So let me ask you, in terms of where we've been these 12 episodes, how this is kind of like the first half of the season. Where do you sit? I already talked about where I sit, so where do you sit? I mean, yeah, I think for the 12 episode journey, I'd say eh, I'm a little disappointed, I think would be where I'm at. But I think knowing what I got out of this episode and then knowing that we got two top tens coming next week, I think that sets up some interesting stuff for the back half of the season. So I'm going to reserve judgment until the entire season six is done. Because well, we should always do that because that's been proven years and years in the past where we've debated about stuff in mid season and then, then like the final run is just great. But I like how, but great. I like how you said, like even even though Kings of the Highway was kind of a meh episode, um, mm-hmm. you know, it still was, you know, that's when Liz got captured by wrestler and she got thrown back into jail. So that was even a little bit of the the Liz and Red on the run kind of had a nice punch ending uh there for season three. But yeah, all those mid season finales have been pretty pretty awesome and this was awesome from the standpoint of you know the 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 bonding moment and the character moments and you know if you're you know tied to these characters and these are people that you've grown up with for six years i mean all of that is great but from a story perspective man it would i think it hurt the liz character a lot to be quite honest i did too but we'll see where it goes because it could always i mean can always change i i feel like they always it's Liz. do a really it, good it job. Will. Yeah. Liz gonna Liz. <laughs> oh, see, that's what I'm worried about. Everybody's gonna be yelling at about that. And uh, the flip flop. Yes, and that yeah, you're right. It did a disservice to the character. Hopefully, I, I'm I'm looking forward to the final ten episodes because I think it's gonna be great. It always ends strong. I've yet to have it not end strong. So I have total faith in the writers and everything else. It's just the one character arc is the, my biggest problem. But outside of that, it's still been fun. I, I do wonder if the audience has been as receptive to Red in prison, you know, this this uh, this section of the season, which I, I do agree had to be done at some point um, because you can't have this guy on the run and he never gets caught. So I, I do think it was an interesting um, dynamic. I don't know if everybody in the audience liked it as much as we probably did for the most part. Well, I think they probably like it more if she got more answers, but she did. Yeah, and, she he, did. and he was out of prison a little bit more. I mean, him being incarcerated really limits what he can do and what Red can do. And, you know, I really wish I think Dembe could have gotten a little bit more involved in the actual running of the business. Yeah. Maybe. If I if I had a like Monday morning quarterback, the, the 12 episodes. Right. Right. I would say like I was disappointed that there wasn't more prison time, like more Vega and Vante in the front half of the season because he spent a lot of time in the courtroom, which I know you like, but he spent, I, I love the courtroom stuff. Yeah, I know. I know I'm in the minority, but I did, but he spent a lot of time in the courtroom and he spent a lot of time in the holding cell outside the courtroom versus being in the actual jail itself. I think there right. could have been some really good stuff with the warden. I think there could have been some great stuff with Vontae and Vega. 
then maybe that's still coming up the rest of the season now that Vontae's out. Um, and I think from that perspective, yeah, Dembe could have done, I mean, Dembe did quite a bit, you know, running the business, but yeah, with that, a lot more focus on Hasham in the first 12 and especially Hasham and Liz working together would have been interesting, especially given their moment of the, Oh, it was you that turned him in sort of. Right. But hindsight is always twenty twenty, and you know, we never know where they're going until they get there. So we'll yeah. see how it plays out. I mean, at least I'm, at least I'm the, excited for the back half. The one thing I think that we can say that season six, first 12 episodes showed is that they have a plan. So when people mm-hmm. get to the end of the series and go, oh, they just made that crap up at the last minute. No, they clearly have this stuff thought out well in advance. So the naysayers can go poo poo. And I recommend that everybody that wants answers comes to C2E2. Yes, because then you can ask them yourself face to face directly. It is tomorrow if you're listening to this podcast as soon as it came out, uh, March 23rd. And we are going to be up there in the fourth floor rooms at 1.30 p.m. Central Time here in Chicago. And there's uh, lots of people coming from the podcast community. Uh, They're coming from all corners of the earth. Uh, We got people coming from Quebec, from Texas, from Jersey, from New York, from Ontario. Uh, So definitely come on out. C2E2 is going to be a blast. Uh, Aaron is moderating the panel. We're going to get a sneak peek of what's coming up for the rest of the season and we are going to ask John all the questions that Liz didn't. <laughs> and he's, he's not going to answer that part. <laughs> <laughs> who is Red Reddington? Well, he's a dead guy. Ah, who is our Red Reddington? Uh, he's not the dead guy. All right, John. Thanks. <laughs> and he's not the father. <laughs> and he's not the father. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, yeah, please, please come. And if you're there for both days, you can come see me do Cobra Kai. Ah, yes, with, yes, yes. With the Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio and Billy Zabka. So that'll be fun. Please check those out. And then, All right. And then afterwards, Aaron will leave in a body bag because he'll be dead tired. <laughs> I will. Man, I, I got to tell you, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really excited. But when it's over, I am probably going to go to bed. <laughs> <For all of next laughs> That's my week. plan. It has been a nonstop three weeks. And I really, once again, thank you, Rory. Uh, I I could I would have done the show. Dis- I'm, you can tell I'm, I'm really tired right now. I couldn't even imagine trying to do it during during all that because I go to see so many movies and I have to review them all and I have to get them on Rotten Tomatoes ASAP or else you know people get bitchy. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of a lot of that. Well, we appreciate all you do and giving us all the stuff that we can look forward to watching when Blacklist takes a break over the summer. Yeah, and I do want to you know quick plug. I don't plug my my other podcast very often, but if because I did so much work on that episode, if you want to go listen to the South by Southwest episode, we actually have a little clip from from uh, Ralph Macchio and Billy Zabka on there, as well as Kevin Costner's on there. Um, we got some other little secrets and, and goodies that are that are in that episode where you can hear that. And we talk about every movie we saw at South by. Go to the Hollywood Outsider dot com or go to the find the podcast the Hollywood Outsider. And it's it's a really good episode. I really enjoyed that one. And we get to talk about a lot of movies that you might not even hear of. Well, we should tell everybody that next week is a two-hour episode. What? what? And they are both in the top 10. Top 10 mm. next week, people. So buckle up. It's going to be a, a good start to the second half of the season. Now, do you, do you know the names? Don't tell me. But do you know the names of the people? Uh, you'll have to come to C2E2 to find those out. <laughs> That's not what I'm going to say. Do you, Troy Heinrich, do you know the names? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, the press releases are out by now. You can find it anywhere you want. But okay. yes, I know do, the names. Do they surprise? Does any either one of them surprise you? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like for these being top tens, it's very interesting names for a top 10 blacklister. Okay. That's so, all I want to know. I don't want to know who they are. I don't want anything else. I don't want to know. But good good to know. But for all, the, for all the 160s and 150s we've dealt with for the first 12, I'm excited for two top tens. <laughs> bang bang just like that well, well thanks everybody for listening we've got we are exhausted we've got a lot to do we've got a lot to prep for c2e2 and, and the blacklist panel and i we want to say real quick and thank you to those of you that are supporting the show by going to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the blacklist gsm that's patreon.com slash the blacklist gsm or anywhere you see the word support the show you can help make the podcast better by throwing a few dollars, pound, yen, whatever in the hat, so to speak. We have different support levels for you where you, you get cool rewards like a t-shirt. You can become a task force or a syndicate member. You can even get your own blacklist number, official blacklist number. And everybody that is a $5 contributor or more gets early access to our interviews. And just in a minute, you're going to hear from Vontae Jones himself 
Coy Stewart. Yes, I had a chance to sit down with him. Those that are at our $5 and higher patron level did get to hear that episode early, but now all of you get to hear it in just a second. And for those of you that did listen on the Patreon feed at the $5 or more level, there's an extra question that we asked him specifically for tonight's episode. So you'll want to listen to the interview again so you can hear what that question is because we couldn't ask it beforehand because you had to wait until this episode aired. So definitely check out the interview uh, when we come back in just a bit. But we want to say special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters, uh, Doug and Marilyn and Lacey. Uh, We had a nice call and chat the other night uh, that we get to uh, do a monthly call. So we talked about some blacklist stories and got to know each other's professions and stuff. So that was kind of fun. little insider with Troy, if you will. And then, of course, we have our task force members, Leonie, Brandon, Jim, Stacy, Florian. They all got T-shirts and they're sporting them the other day. It was really cool to see those out in the wild and just uh, really happened for happy for Kevin, Paulette, Priscilla, Isabel, Richard, now James, Judy, Rachel and Sharon for being at that five dollar or more level to get the interview. So thanks so much, guys, for helping us out. Thank you so much. All right. With that, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. We will say goodbye to Aaron as he gets ready to lead the panel tomorrow. And we then will see you on the other side of the interview. Uh, Stay back. We'll be back with Coy Stewart right after this. Hi, I'm Daryl. And I'm Addie. And we host the Stranger Things podcast, a fan podcast dedicated to the Netflix original series, Stranger Things. If you're a child of the 80s like me, you probably love Stranger Things because it reminds you a lot of the great movies that we enjoyed as kids. And if you're a child of the 2000s like I am, you probably enjoy Stranger Things because you love the actors who star on the show and appreciate the work that they do. You may not be thinking much about Stranger Things right now since the show isn't coming back until the summer of 2019. But we love Stranger Things and the Stranger Things fandom so much, we want to talk about it even during the off season. That's right, Addie. So, while we're waiting for the show to come back, we're taking a look at some of the films that inspired Stranger Things. So far, we've looked at Gremlins, Ghostbusters, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and E.T. And in the months ahead, we'll be looking at other great films like Aliens, The Goonies, Jaws, Firestarter, The Thing, and more. We also invite a member of the Stranger Things fandom to join us for each movie discussion. So check out the Stranger Things podcast at goldenspiralmedia.com slash strange or find us in your favorite podcast app. And until next time, stay strange. Hey, Dembe Loyals, this is Hisham Taufik. You are listening to Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Well, tonight we got a special guest with us here on the Blacklist Exposed. He came onto the scene at age 13 where he netted an award for supporting young actor in the Young Artist Award for his role on Are We There Yet on TBS. You can see him currently playing Vontae Jones on the Blacklist, Red's right-hand man, in prison because nobody can replace Dembe, but Coy Stewart <laughs> is certainly going to try. Please welcome Coy to the program. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I think the first question the fans want to know out of the gate is pimento loaf, your favorite <laughs> lunch meat. <laughs> you know, uh, in prison, absolutely. Uh, but I'll say as a free man, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> so you're more Turkey ham. What's your, what's your favorite? Yeah, I think I think I'm a ham guy. Um, but you know, either ham or turkey, those are those are my top two. There you go, sure. there you go. So uh, just, yeah. I mean, you've you've been at this for about seven years now. So why did you want to become an actor in the first place? You know, at first it started out. Uh, you know, as a kid, I always wanted to be on Disney Channel or, or Nickelodeon, and um, my parents were were crazy enough to to help me pursue that dream. And I think around the age of like 15 or 16, it kind of transitioned into, no, I really want to make this a, a career, you know, and I, I started to fall in love with the art itself. Um, and it just, it just grew from there. It just grew from, you know, are we there yet to being on Nickelodeon for a little bit. And now at 20, I'm uh, transitioning from that, that, that kid phase into more uh, of an adult career with things like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Blacklist and things like that. So uh, it's definitely blossomed into something amazing, but it started out with just a simple idea of, of wanting to be on TV as a kid. I think that's everybody's dream, right? And then you get like a dream role. You're literally sitting across from James Spader on the Blacklist. Yeah. When they called you up for the audition, what, did, what, what was going through your mind? 
Oh man, well it's crazy because I I live in LA and uh, as you know, Blacklist shoots in New York, so I never really expected to get a call for this show. You know, usually they they rarely cast outside of you know the local area uh, for TV shows, and so when I got the call for this, uh, they wanted me to put it on tape and send it in, and I was over the moon. I was so excited, and when I read this character, I was like, this is perfect. It was perfect, and. I always like to take a few days before an audition to kind of get into the mindset of the character. And for some reason, for Vontae, it was so easy. I mean, as soon as I read it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with him and, and the choices that I wanted to make. And it's funny because I never really thought about the intimidating part of working with James until like the night before. I kind of panicked because I, I, the entire time up until I was just excited to be a part of the show, but then the night before I was watching the blacklist just, you know, to study and, and, and uh, learn some more about the world. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm actually going to be sitting across from this man tomorrow morning. And I kind of went through all the, you know, the, the panic thinking in my mind. And then finally I was like, you know what? I'm here. They want me here. And I'm going to show up and um, hopefully help, help Red while he's in prison. So it was definitely a crazy, crazy turn of events. I mean, I got the audition and I think maybe a week later I was in New York. So it was awesome. TV moves fast, man. TV moves fast. Yeah, absolutely. So how many episodes did you end up watching then to prepare for the show? Did you watch the whole thing up to this point? or I have. So I used to watch it um, a couple years ago. I took a little break and I kind of picked up where I was. I think I was somewhere season three, maybe season four. And I'm almost actually caught up. So I'm, I'm like in two timelines right now because, of course, I'm watching what's happening now. But I'm somewhere in season four right now as far as from one up until so i'm kind of all over the place but i've definitely gotten a gist of the world and, and obviously from watching it and and being on set and being around it you really you really learn a lot and it's quick too so so when everybody comes on the show we always ask them so who do you think well we know that raymond reddington isn't raymond reddington anymore right because we got that reveal at the end of season yeah. five yeah but, but who do you think the yeah. imposter is who do you have a do you have an inkling at this point Oh my goodness. You know, I really don't know. I really do not know. And I, I wish I could have more of a clue, but the reason that I have no idea is because it's the blacklist and because they're so good at giving you things that you think are clues and they're, mo they're rarely ever are, you know, they always throw this kind of wild card at you. You know, I wish I could go to set and just ask, you know, get all the information myself, but I know I would never be able to do that. But I really, I really have no idea. I've thought about some options and I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows who it is and who knows what they're going to throw at us? Because the fact that there's an imposter in general was always bananas to me. So I have no idea where they're going to take it, but I'm so excited to find out. I love all the people at the end of season four that were like, he's totally your father. And I was like, it's a 30 year old shirt with DNA on it. <laughs> it could be anybody. It could be, it, exactly. could, it could be Ronald it could Reagan be for all anybody. Yeah, exactly. It could be anybody, which is why I'm like, who knows at this point, you know? Well, I, I think one of the fun things about having you on this season specifically is just that you know, we don't get to talk about location a lot about the show. They, they literally make Staten right. Island look like the desert or the, the English countryside. Yeah. So where, where is the prison? Where, where are you guys filming that stuff? We are actually somewhere in New Jersey. I'm from Los Angeles, so I'm not too familiar with the New York area, but I know we're somewhere in New Jersey, and it's actually a real prison, which is, which is really cool. We shoot a lot of the, all of the exterior stuff that you see in the prison yard and all that stuff. That is all at actual prison, and then we're, we're actually on set when we have like the cell scenes and the, the, um, the lunch hall, the mess hall scenes and stuff like that, but when we're outside, we're at a real prison, which was, which was great. I mean, it really helped get into that mindset. Now, is this prison a, a working prison, or is it one that's been shut down? So you got ghost stories and all that fun stuff? I believe it's been shut down. Yeah, I believe it's been shut down. I don't think it's an active prison anymore. I didn't hear many ghost stories, but uh, it definitely is not a, a place that you want to hang around alone. That's for sure. It was definitely, it definitely had some creepy elements to it. They're getting down to be like eight o'clock at night. It's like uh, craft services is leaving. So we got to leave now too. <laughs> Something going on. <laughs> yeah, here. exactly. Exactly. As soon as my call time is up, I'm out. I'm out. I'll be at home. The big thing that I want to talk to you about is this episode that you were just in recently. I think we last saw you in episode 610, which was the prison mm -hmm. breakout episode. Red had a really interesting line in this episode. He was talking about the fact uh, and this concept that Red may lose hope 
and even commit suicide is something that seemed like it came out of this language, right? It was, uh, uh, he said specifically, mm-hmm. uh, if you're sentenced to life in prison, there would be nothing to hope for and without hope, nothing to live for. And one of the fans in the community right. had come back and said, well, is he contemplating suicide? And it, it seemed like maybe that's why Liz was going to check on him in a prison to, to foil the prison break and mm-hmm. everything. But, but the suicide thing is actually something near and dear to your heart in particular because you got to do something pretty cool with logic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, I was in the 1-800 video, which was an absolutely incredible experience. Is there a reason why you wanted to do that in particular? Is there something that touched you that said, hey, Logic, I want to team up with you for this, for this particular video, which was amazing, by the way. If you haven't seen it, we'll put a link up to it in the show notes over at theblacklistexposed.com because Koi is just fantastic in it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I was out at dinner uh, with my girlfriend and my manager called me and she, she never calls me uh, past like, you know, seven o'clock maybe is like the latest she'll ever call me, but it was, it was about nine o'clock. She called me and um, she said, Hey, do you want to be in this logic video tomorrow? And <laughs> I said, uh, sure, I guess what, what's the, you know, what's the concept that I had never really considered being in music videos. I'm not a dancer, so that, that wasn't going to work. So I, I was curious as to what she meant. And um, she said, well, they have this treatment. It's for the song 1-800. And um, just take a look at it and let me know what you think. So she sent me the email. I read over it, and I was floored. I was blown away. I have dealt with people in my life who, uh, you know, have mental health issues and have attempted suicide or I've talked about suicide before. So it's something very near and dear to me. And also I'm just a huge mental health advocate. I feel like if our mental health is not being taken care of, then nothing is, you know? So when I read that treatment, I was just so excited to be able to do it. I was a bit nervous because we were, they were, you know, shooting the next day. And I, I usually like to take at least a day to prep. And this, up to date has still been my most intense role. And, you know, I, I was hoping I would get more time to prep, but they were like, you know, we have to shoot starting tomorrow. So I just took a leap of faith. And I think that it actually helped me even more because I didn't have a chance to kind of overthink my choices. I just threw myself into it. And, and, uh, the director, Andy Hines was incredible. And, and the way we would shoot, it was amazing. We would just kind of be in these different scenarios and he would, kind of give me an explanation of where I've just come from or maybe where I'm going or maybe what my goal is in that scene. But that was about it. And we got so much amazing footage and, and they cut it together beautifully. So it's definitely something uh, I think I'm the most proud of um, because it's the reason why I'm an actor, you know, to, to bring change and, and, and open conversations, open dialogue. And I feel like that video does that exactly. So I'm super happy and honored that I was able to be a part of that. Yeah, and the full song title is 1-800-273-8255. For those of you that know, yes. that's the uh, phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Helpline. Um, just super mm-hmm. that Logic would put that together and have you be part of it. Because especially in that video, uh, we, we've actually touched on you know a, a couple times in the blacklist, uh, this concept of either... Um, gender changing with like the gin or mm-hmm. homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And in this particular video, you had to play a homosexual character in that as well, right across from facing yeah. Don, Don Cheadle, wasn't it? Yeah. Is, is your dad? Yes. Don Cheadle played my dad. Yeah, that's right. Just a powerful, powerful piece. And just uh, so glad that you were able to bring that to the world, man. It was really good. Really good. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I was so excited to be a part of that. And I was nervous about it because I wanted to make sure that I was represent- representing the, the LGBTQ community correctly. Um, and because I'm not part of it, I wanted to make sure that I had the right to even speak on the conversation. Um, but you know, I, I have a, I have a little sister who is transgender and I, I've always supported her and I've always told her that I have her back. And I, and I got this, this thing that just fell in my lap and I, and I thought, what's, what is a better way to show her that I care, you know? And it was, it was this, it was this, you know, I, I can tell you how much I support you and love you, but if I'm not comfortable enough to advocate for you to the world, then what does that matter? You know? So, um, and yeah, like you said, I got to work with Don Cheadle, which was incredible. The coolest, one of the coolest guys ever. And I, and I, and I like to pick up gems and I like to pick up pieces of, of lessons and stories from people like 
you know, James Spader and Don Cheadle and things like that. So I think these are moments that I will look back on in my career and be, be really proud and really happy of. And you're just starting, man. That's the best part. Like 20 years old, you got yeah, Cheadle and you. Spader, just uh, mentors already <laughs> in your young career. It's totally cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So you're acting, you're doing the video, but that's not all that Koi is all about, guys. I mean, you're you're a musician too, <laughs> and you just released your first album. I did. That's right. Uh, tell us a little about the album. Why did you decide to do Everybody's Got One? I've always been a huge hip hop fan or a music fan in general. Actually, it has directly correlated with my my um, my acting because anytime I, I uh, book a role, I kind of make a playlist for all of my characters to just kind of listen to while I'm, you know, in that environment, whether I'm in a different city or I'm on set or whatever the case may be. So music and acting have always gone hand in hand for me. And um, my best friend, Tyrell Williams, he is an incredible musician. And we have been making music since we were kids. Um, most of which was completely horrible. I think over the last like two or three years, we, we really kind of bunkered down and focused in on, on what we wanted to do. And, I kind of ask myself, like, do I have the opportunity to kind of tell more um, and give more with music? And I found that I, I do. You know, the amazing thing about acting is that you can go and tell a story. But with, with acting, it is a collaborative process. You know, you would have never seen me on the blacklist or on, or on the logic video without everybody who was involved in that. And so it's great to be able to control every aspect creatively um, as far as a musician. And I, I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with writing poetry and writing raps and, and, and producing beats and expressing myself in that way. Um, and I found with music, you know, I can say exactly what I want. Uh, and I think the beauty in acting is kind of finding the opposite of that, you know, kind of finding a way to send a message without just saying the message. So I, I really found uh, a balance of the best of both worlds um and so everybody's got one is is an album about your ego it's an album about something that i went through in my life where i found myself at a crossroads of you know happiness and making others happy i realized that at the end of the day you know when you get home at night and there's nobody around and it's just you you're gonna know whether or not you made the right choices that day that made you happy you know, and you can lie to yourself all you want, but I think that's something that we all go through. You know, we all adapt and change and make choices based off of, you know, what other people think of us or what we think other people think of us. And we're in a, such a, a crazy age of social media and, and everybody can say anything about anybody at any time. I found that mentality getting into my head. And so through the process of making the album, I was able to find my footing a little bit um, just as a person and kind of figure out what direction I wanted to go. And I actually never even set out to make an album. I, I was just making music. And I think after about like 20 tracks, I looked back and I said, I should kind of make this a, a, a album, you know, and, and we kind of sat down and listened through all of them and handpicked some of them and, and put them in a certain order and refined them a little bit. And, and then we got everybody's got one. So it was a, it was a great experience. And I love how you talk about personality and how you act as a human. Uh, it's a really great, uh, I want to call it a mathematical equation, right? But it's, it, it's person mm. times environment equals behavior. And I think when you sit Absolutely. back and you say, like, what, am I, what is my outward-facing presence to the world? I could either be a complete right. asshole or I could say, mm -hmm. well, I'm trying to be good, but because of my environment where I grew up, I'm never going to succeed. And that just that immediately makes your behavior come out in a certain way. So I love that you're exactly. talking about that in, in, in the album and just being who you are and being real and making sure that you're doing good in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's something that, you know, I hope everybody can, can kind of go through that process themselves and kind of just figure out what do you want as a person versus, you know, what does everybody else want for you? And I think once you start making those choices that genuinely make you happy, you know, you will find yourself to not only be happier, but you'll find yourself in positions where, you can do those things. Those things will start to come to fruition. Um, but it's all about your mindset. And uh, that's what the album's about. 
which goes back to the 1-800 video because it's like you have to be in that mindset. You have to be willing to either have surround yourself with friends and be able to pick up that phone and call the number or be strong Absolutely. enough yourself to call the number. And uh, obviously the video turns out well at the end, which is great. But yes, yes, yeah, 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 definitely. It's all about that. And it's all about, you know, not being afraid to to let people know who you are, you know, and, and what that means for you. And if people don't like it, find a new group of people you know there's always somebody in the world that we can relate to and i think that that's a huge upside to this new craze of social media is that people can find groups and communities that that are just the same as them you know we're not in an age anymore where you have to travel across the world to find someone who who likes the same show as you do i hope that people can you know take advantage of that and and find their own footing and i love too that you tie that all in very well because you decided not to say it's an album by Corey Stewart. You said it's an album by K O I, which is Koi, yeah. but like the Koi fish, right? Which usually resembles peace and tranquility in your backyard. And absolutely. Absolutely. It. Yeah. It's like, it's like my alter ego almost. And I, um, I was able to kind of switch back and forth between Koi and Koi, which I thought was a, was a really fun, fun little play on words that I found. Well, you can definitely get the album on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, and we'll have links to those, of course, up in theblacklistexposed.com. But don't just stream it. Make sure you buy it as well, because that always helps out. Awesome. Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. We have another podcast on our network here, Golden Spiral Media, that covers Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question, because it's been yes. gone for a while. You know, Thanos snapped his fingers uh-huh. and half the world disappeared, <laughs> including Agents yes, of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Yeah. So, but it sounds like Flint is coming back when Shield returns. Yeah, you know, I uh, I can't say too much. I can't say, you know how it is with Marvel. I can't say too much at all. But the star of the show, Clark Gregg, who plays uh, Agent Coulson, he 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 died in in the original Avengers film. You know, so in Marvel, I, I don't think anybody's ever ever really gone or ever really dead. I would be I would be remiss to say that you will not see again um i just don't know in what capacity and i'm not sure when but that show is is so much fun to be a part of and um it's another one kind of off the bucket list i mean who wouldn't want to be a superhero you know so i love it and the multi-level marketing that you get out of it too between the movies and then tying it into the tv show and having it all line up i mean it's just so much fun I mean, who knew Col- Coulson was a time traveler? He went all the way back to the 90s for Captain Marvel last weekend. <laughs> oh, my goodness, which I just saw last night, by the way, which is so, so amazing. So good. But, um, no spoilers, though. Yeah, I still mean... Still new, still new. No spoilers, no spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I first joined the, the team, um, it was around the same time that Black Panther came out, so I was luckily able to get a ticket to the premiere. And it's just little stuff like that that, you know, is so cool and... and you never, you never really think about, it, you know, but I was so grateful to be able to go there and, and see that movie like for the first time with the world. Um, so much fun. So the Marvel world is, is one of the best. I, I know you're a busy guy. You've got to have new projects that are coming up down the pipe somewhere. Did I hear Netflix in your future? Definitely. Yeah. I've got a show called um, Mystery Gracie is coming out, which is uh, a show with the comedian Gabriel Gracie. He was going to be a teacher instead of a comedian. This is what the show is about. Um, it's about him and his life uh, as a teacher, and I play one of his students. So that will be on Netflix coming out later this year. And I also have a show called Kipo, which is an animated series about a post-apocalyptic world and a group of kids. Uh, and I play a character, Benson, uh, who is a, a young black uh, gay teenager. That's what's coming up this year. There should be some more things, but I'll, I'll stay quiet about that for now. Uh, but Netflix is, is definitely what's, what's happening this year. It seems like, and I, I think the best part about it is that you got the, the, the video work, you got the TV work, then you got the, the animation work. I mean, for you being, you know, just seven years into this business so far, did you find acting in real life is more challenging than the animation or is the voiceover work actually more difficult? You know, th- there's pros and cons. The thing I love about voiceover is that I can show up in my pajamas. That's always great. That's always a, a pro. There's, pro, there's, a, there's a, a beautiful balance between both, right? Because there's something so amazing about being live action, being there, whether it's in a prison or in space or whatever the case may be, being there, having that physicality, those, those senses are being sparked. 
that's always amazing. And there's also something really amazing about animation because you can create a whole world. And I had never done animation before uh, working on Kibo, and now we're we're pretty far into it. And it's so cool to see how they are able to adapt the world around the choices that I make and the things that I say and the way I say things. And that's also so cool to be able to see. And I, I honestly haven't seen much of it. Um, we all know animation takes so long to develop, but I can't wait to see it. And, and um, it's so fun to watch them kind of build and craft that world. We just finished watching 612 today. This interview's coming out. Yeah. You're here. I have to ask, man. Red pulled some strings. Fonte Jones is out of the clink. <laughs> uh, yes, what, he did. He did. What, what can you tease about Vante Jones's future on the blacklist? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think we all know that Raymond Reddington, when he finds friends, he keeps those friends. And uh, I think Vante was really lucky to, to join the team. Um, he was able to pull some strings. Vante is out. And I think from here on out, you can just expect Vante to, to be a part of the large, large family of the Blacklist. Um, as you know, through watching the show, uh, Raymond is always incredible at bringing back old friends. Um, so, you know, this doesn't mean that Vante is going to be by his side 24 seven, but I think that, you know, it's clear Vante is out now. And, um, anytime Red needs his help, I'm pretty sure Vante is going to be there uh, to pick up the call. Who's the first person of the squad that you actually want to shake hands with? Is it Glenn? Is it Brimley? Dembe? Oh my goodness. I, I would have to say Dembe. I would have to say Dembe. And, and, and it's because there's so much Vontae can learn from Dembe as far as being Red's right-hand man. Uh, um, you know, he, he did a, a great job in prison, but uh, the outside world is very, very different than prison is. So I think it would have to be Dembe. Just don't replace our, our, our wonderful awesomeness of Dembe. <laughs> You could be, you, 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 yeah. you're like the sidecar. You guys could be partners, but you can't replace them. Fans will go riot. Exactly. No, no one, no one could ever, but I would just love to be his protege. There you go. <laughs> awesome, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's Coy Stewart, everybody. Vontae Jones on season six of the blacklist. And you can of course go ahead and see the 1-800 video and get the album on the website at the blacklist exposed.com. We'll have all the links up there in Coy's post. Uh, Coy, where can people find you if they want to engage with you in your community? Yes. Uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and all socials, it's at Coy Stewart, C O I S C E W A R T. Um, on there, I stay updated on all the new projects that I have as well as, uh, more music coming out this year. Awesome. Thanks so much, Quay, for being here. Totally appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, man. Hopefully we can uh, do this again soon. All right. Well, that will conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at The Blacklist GSM, where we live tweet during the East Coast feed when possible, and we use the show's hashtag The Blacklist. But we didn't do that this week because we're going to Chicago, baby. That's right. That's right. It's going to be fun. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and join the Facebook group. You'll get some pictures from the C2E2 event. Search for The Blacklist Exposed. Talk about the show, the podcast, or your favorite magic trick. <laughs> Big thanks for listening. Don't forget to answer our profiling question. Who will find the flash drive first? Remember that poor mom and that poor kid have it. He hasn't found it yet. He's going to find it. He's going to pop it in because kids can't find things like that and not push buttons. I know who's going to find it. Who? Hudson. Hudson? Yeah, the dog. He's got a good sniffer. Oh, my sniffer. God. Isn't he dead? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> He's got to be dead, right? He's dead. All right. Take care, guys. See you later. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.